Ralph Nader is an author, consumer advocate, and former presidential candidate. He is one of America's most effective social critics and has emerged as a leading voice against the growing convergence of government and corporate interests. He is the author of Unstoppable, the Emerging Left-Right Alliance to Dismantle the Corporate State. The title of Mr. Nader's remarks are Eisenhower's Warning, Prophetic and Presently Understated. Please join me in welcoming the distinguished Ralph Nader. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to make some very compressed remarks. Uh, some of you can elaborate them at sub subsequent uh, meetings. And um, the importance is that we're here together. Uh, and the really only hope to deal with this monster that has emerged uh, is a left-right alliance. Some of you may remember Ron Paul and uh, Barney Frank had a congressional caucus to try to do something with the bloated military budget, which was a step, uh, but then they both left Congress for other reasons. <coughs> when Eisenhower spoke on this, uh, he, he wanted to use the word uh, military congressional industrial complex, and they persuaded him to drop the congressional because he was already hot enough water. And he didn't, <laughs> he didn't want to be too alienated <coughs> Uh, but before he said that, in 1961, in his farewell address, in 1953, before the National Association of Editors here in Washington, their convention, he did what no other president has done since. It was called the Cross of Iron speech, and he said, we can destroy the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union can destroy the United States. Is this the way we want to live? And so he drew a line, and he said, so many bombers could build so many schools. And so many destroyers give us so many roads and bridges, on and on, and hospitals and so on. And it's interesting that no, no other president has come close to mentioning uh, this kind of trade-off. Out of fear uh, that comes from many directions. It's not just fear of Lockheed Martin's campaign contributions. Uh, it's fear of being denounced by the American Legion, the VFW, the labor unions who might lose jobs. It's, it's a, a comprehensive source of dread uh, for politicians. And so they have dropped the ball and have not upheld their congressional duties in terms of uh, the appropriations, the authorization, the war declaration functions. And it's only gotten worse. The interesting thing about this is how it's gotten worse. And if you're a theoretician on statism or corporate welfare or the corporate state, uh, apart from its horror, uh, it is a fascinating exercise in corporate lawyer brilliance. And behind all of this are the corporate attorneys. Make no mistake about it. The structures of immunities and privileges, the contracts, the evasions, the ability to rationalize uh, the corporate law firms are the least reported institutions of power in our country. And we should always keep that in mind because uh, they're recruiting the vast majority of law students uh, into their mission. And their mission is a totally amoral drive to get more clients, more bonuses, more partners, and more merry-go-round uh, into the government and out of the government for uh, these partners. Uh, so let's uh, let's show let's see how it tightens. And Bruce Fine has lived this, so uh, you know he can elaborate this. Today and yesterday and the day before, I turned on WTOP. WTOP is the military industrial complex's favorite radio station. In fact, even though this isn't the biggest radio market. The last I checked, it is the number one revenue uh, of any radio station in the country. Well, first you have J.J. Green, who pairs up with advertisers from the military-industrial complex, usually starts about 7.15 a.m., 
And the technique is, J.J. Green scares us. Uh, and, 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 you know, they're coming everywhere. You know, from everywhere but UFOs. Terror, disaster, sabotage. And then comes the ad. You know, we'll take care of your software problems. We'll take care of your air, aircraft problems and so on. So in the last three days, just gradually turning this on, there's a, a contract, I couldn't quite catch the name because it was so quick, something like Huntington. And here's what it was. When you order two aircraft carriers at once, you get a bargain price. You save $2 billion. And you supply a business for hundreds of suppliers in dozens of states. Catch that. And you also engage in job innovation. And you restore our aircraft carriers to 12. I always thought we already had 12. The nearest country challenging us is Italy with two. Because an aircraft carrier today is useless except for empire, except for force projection, because it's a sitting duck. Now we're starting to say China. China bought a broken down Ukrainian aircraft carrier. You know, Black Sea, Ukraine. They rebuilt it, and now they're building a more modern one. See, see the game that's played? Why WTOP? Because that's who members of Congress listen to, for the sports and weather and traffic, etc. Now, that illustrates how they've neutralized the press. You have more full-time reporters working on Congress than ever in American history. Surprise. And you might say, why aren't we getting better stories? Because they're mostly ditto heads. They just ditto head themselves. And there's not that much to cover to begin with. Our revered Republican Party has decided they can have a massive tax break for the wealthy without any public hearings. Our revered Republican Party, masquerading as conservatives when they're really corporatists, wants to destroy the civil justice system, the tort law system. So they get five bills through the House of Representatives on a party line vote without a congressional hearing. I mean, it's only Jefferson and Madison and all the rest and the Seventh Amendment and the second major complaint against King George III taking away our trial by jury. You know, it's just trivial stuff like that. So the Hill doesn't cover it. Uh, roll Call doesn't cover the military up there. Political, why? Have you ever seen their publications? One page after another. McDonald, you know, and the Lockheed, and, and Boeing, and Raytheon, they know where their bread's buttered. They've neutralized the media. The second intensivity of the military-industrial complex is even more beyond anybody's uh, scenario of 30, 40 years ago. In 1992, Congress passed a law. It actually, it was 1990, it was enforceable. In 92, that all government departments and agencies had to submit audible data to the GAO um, in order to allow the GAO to audit the departments and agencies. That's the arm of Congress. Guess which department has violated it every year? They're in violation of federal law. It's the Department of Defense. And all they always promise. We'll have it in 1996, and we'll have it in 2001, and we'll have it in 2008. And every Secretary of Defense comes up that we do need to audit the, the uh, Pentagon budget. At the same time, they make admissions like, oh, we can't account for $9 billion lost in Iraq, the criminal war in Iraq, in one year. $9 billion. You know, remember Dirksen? You know, $4 billion here, $2 billion there, $1 billion here. Pretty soon it adds up to real money. Huh? Then the Air Force admits years ago, they have to buy billions of spare parts, billions of dollars of spare parts, because he couldn't locate it in all its sprawling warehouses all over the world, where they had the spare parts. And of course, an auto, unaudited budget is a breeding ground for criminality, for corporate criminality, for government criminality, for bribery, waste, corruption, illegal authorization, Bruce Fine's favorite example is Libya. How about this? Libya, Hillary's war. She actually overrode Robert Gates, Secretary of Defense, who said to Obama, you don't want to do this to Libya. 
This is a tribal society with a dictatorship. You know what happens when you topple a dictatorship in a tribal society? Total civil war spilling off into all sorts of countries in Africa. And that's what happened. But no, Hillary, you know, trying to be tough. She wants to be as tough as those men, right? She goes to the White House and gets them to topple Obama. Where'd the money, uh, topple uh, Gaddafi, where'd the money come from? It didn't come from Congress. There was no authorization. There is no uh, appropriation. There is no declaration of war. Apparently now you can bomb other countries, and if they can't reach you with any aircraft, it's not a war. Okay? So the, the prostitution of constitutional doctrine is, is grotesque. And so here's, here's what happens when you have this. You get more outsourcing to these defense companies. You know, I was a cook in the army. We know how to cook. The army now sources its food. And the fraud is unbelievable. Like they, they charge 38 bucks for a tray, and if a GI has a hot meal and he gets another tray, that, you know, under the second, first tray, that's another 38 bucks. Crazy, wild corruption. And that's not the end of it. When the Pentagon budget is not audited, Empire goes crazy. There are no constraints. Congress doesn't constrain them. Therefore, the press doesn't know about it or want to know about it. Have you ever seen the present, the, the uh, Pentagon press score? It's a substitute for pretzels. <laughs> to make one challenging comment, you're gone. You're ostracized. You won't be called on, and you might be recalled by your company. This is where we're going. The military-industrial complex is a dictatorship, an extremely intensive, choreographed dictatorship like we have never seen before. There are brutal dictatorships, but they're nowhere near as intricate. So you have an unaudited budget, which means what happens to contracts? What happens to contracts when you have an oligopoly to begin with? You have five or six prime defense contractors. What happens to contracts? They're not contracts. Some of you may remember the legal historian from Britain in the 19th century, Henry Maine, when he said the transition from medieval serfdom to free workers was marked by the transition from status to contract. In other words, the status of a, a serf to a free negotiating work, artisans. Well, we now have moved the Pentagon contract from contract back to status. Who do you think is going to build the nuclear subs besides General Dynamics with all their subcontractors? So you've eliminated the instrument of legal accountability. When they go way over the contract, it's just another golden handshake. They even have a phrase for it. This should be a Pentagon, by the way, dictionary. You know, defoliation, you know. What do you think that is? Chemical warfare. You remember the $450 claw hammer that you can get for 10 or 12 bucks in a hardware store? That embarrassed the Pentagon more than billions of dollars of overruns, F-35s, Osprey, you name it, because people understand that. So I'm saying to myself, how in the world could the Pentagon dispersing agency pay 450 bucks for each claw hammer? I mean, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Well, what happens is you contract with the prime, they go to the sub, then the sub can't do it all, then they contract to the sub and the sub and the sub and the sub, and you're down with some factory that produces claw hammers. And then it goes all the way back up. Mark up, mark up, mark up, mark up, mark up. But that isn't sufficient to explain how they can actually use a taxpayer's check for a $450 hammer. So in comes the nomenclature of the Pentagon linguists. You know what they called the claw hammer on the billing? Or they accepted it from the contractor? A unidirectional impact generator. <laughs> so. So out goes contracts, out goes accountability, out goes oversight, out goes uh, 
uh, any, any kind of disclosure to raise the ire of the American taxpayer and generate the public sentiment that Abraham Lincoln has said is so uh, critical uh, to get in, in anything, anything done. And in, in the process, we have John Kenneth Galbraith, 30 years ago, said, nationalize it. Why? Because 95% of their business is government. I mean, why go through the charade of putting it in a private corporation that wants to maximize profits and bonuses when you can have the government do it and they don't have quite the greed motivation to keep ordering more and more and more and they're also under the eye of the taxpayer. Well, they didn't listen to, to, to Galbraith. So in the process, we have massive outsourcing of governmental functions that even libertarians might consider proper. We have outsourcing of fighting Blackwater. We have outsourcing of logistics and repair in the theater of battle. We have outsourcing and jeopardizing our soldiers with food and drinking water. These are all case records. And to top it off, when you try to sue these contractors, they cover, they say, we're sovereign immunity. They've already pleaded that they're really part of government when it comes to being held accountable because they put up defective military equipment of which we once put a whole report out on. So more and more you see, you see the privilege and immunities of so-called private corporations with all the government functions there too to further entrench themselves. You have these huge salaries uh, of, of Lockheed Market. Why should 95% of the business, why should that be allowed? these huge salaries and bonuses and stock buybacks and, and all the rest. Well, he didn't get anywhere, but then there's Rickover in his final testimony before the Senate, uh, with the Joint Economic Committee, uh, when Reagan canned him, but didn't have the courage to say it to him <coughs> pri privately in the, gold, in the Oval Office. You know, 60 years in the Navy, he's about to be fired. You'd think the Hollywood actor would have given him a couple of minutes. Well, this is quite, we have that out there. We, uh, this is quite a uh, testimony. Uh, he thought that there should be a naval shipbuilding company uh, as a yardstick to the private shipbuilding companies, which he thought were ripping off the government big time and without uh, any diminution in their, uh, in their ambitions. Now, here's another recent extension. My home state's in Connecticut. They have electric boat uh, division in Groton building these subs. There never is enough subs, you know. If you ever ask uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, enough fighter planes, give us a number? Never enough. Enough subs, give us a number? Never enough. Uh, there was a, once a meeting with MIT uh, scientists and James Schlesinger in the Department of Defense and as they were walking out, this is an eyewitness account, as they were walking out of Jim Schlesinger's office, Schlesinger mused, it really is a, it's really so good that the American people don't know the full destructive capability of our weapons. And the physicist who told me this said, yeah, you know what he meant by that? He meant that if we knew that one trident nuclear sub in one hour could wipe out 200 cities in the world, maybe we wouldn't want that many of them. And so here's how bad it's gotten. It's not enough that General Dynamics has a guaranteed market, has a guaranteed cost overrun market, has a guaranteed no congressional oversight market. It now wants the subsidy from the taxpayers of Connecticut for the privilege of building subs near New, New London. And it's already gotten a hundred million dollar package with the ribbon signed by the governor, about to be signed. And they're going for 50 million from Maine. You see, there's no end to the Moloch. There's no end to the gluttony. And let me give you a prediction, and I don't make many predictions. The military, congressional, industrial, empire 
complex, if not stopped, will destroy the United States of America. Because, among other things, it has no self-restraint. Among other things, it must create its own enemies to produce the markets. The saddest day in the complex life was the fall of the Soviet Union. Where do we go next? Tehran. Where do we go next? China. It has to create its own enemies. And that's where the word perdition comes in. And we're not just talking about constitutionalism. It's just what President Eisenhower has said. Every weapon system we don't need is food out of, the, out of the mouths of babies, he said. It's health taken from parents for their children and on and on. So what do we do about it? After all, you know, we can go on all night in condemnation. It's the easiest subject to condemn. It's so against our traditions, our rule of law, our conservative principles, our liberal principles, our progressive principles, our libertarian principles. It's such a massive threat that we can disagree on a lot of other little things. It all is like an invasion from Mars. It unifies us all. Patriotism? What patriotism do they have? They're not patriotic. Getting our country into criminal wars of aggression, violating the Constitution, federal statutes, international treaties that we sponsored and belong to, that's patriotism. Using soldiers who, who go into a voluntary army because they can't afford college and want to save a little money to support their tuition, and feeding them into that grinding machine where they go over and kill a hundred people for every one of them that dies, and then they come back and see you later. But going out, they praise them. Praise them like crazy. Flattery by the plutocracy is a controlling process. And then they say to people, shut up and shop after 9-11. Shut up and shop. And then we're told, thank you for your service. These, you know, we're supposed to say this. So, thank you for what? For being a victim of organized criminals who misuse our laws? Thank you. And when they come back, you're on your own. Stand in line in your wheelchair. I've seen it. And a lot of you have seen it. So what do you do? I wrote a little book called Breaking Through Power, It's Easier Than We Think, and it applies here. And the book outside, for those of you who want to read and think, you know, readers think, thinkers read, and apparently conservatives read more than liberals, judging by the bestseller list. Maybe that's because you dominate talk radio. It's the following. You start out with retired, enlightened military, diplomatic, and national security officials who know what the score is. And there are several hundred of them. 300 spoke out before the Iraq invasion. General Zinni, General Odom, former head of the NSA, Admiral Shanahan, you know, heavy people. James Baker, Brent Scowcroft, so on. So you start out with them. You get some enlightened billionaire to set up a secretariat to facilitate their access to the media, to members of Congress, and, on, and to organize in each congressional district. And once you get 300, you'll have 1,000 within a few months. They know what the score is. They've been there. And they're not all going to be consultants to General Dynamic or Lockheed the great retirement plan for Pentagon ex-officials. The second thing you do is you get a left-right coalition in Congress. You build on the Ron Paul, Barney Frank. We know they're there. Bruce Meeksa, Jim McGovern, Walter Jones. Even if you just start with 20 or 30, that'll give a little courage to another 20 or 30. So we start the process 
the Proxmire process of in intensive investigation and congressional hearings. Then you, you develop something that's quite unique, which is model defense contracts. Not the kind that are set up to fail the taxpayer, not the kind that are set up to ratchet up in terms of fewer F-35s for more money. Not the kind that are set up in order to sell to other countries so we can say they all have F-16s, so we're not first. We have to buy a deficient F-35 to ratchet up. So that's important to do. We have to bring in the judiciary here. The judiciary is the big cop-out branch of government. They have these convenient doctrines, no standing to sue, a political question, how wonderfully modern for medieval times. But we have to get the ju judiciary involved. In terms of getting people aroused in the prior panel, the way you get people aroused is you work with existing mayors who have already had press conferences on diverting some of the bloated military budget to infrastructure back home. Schools, bridges, highways, public transit, uh, sewage, water systems, uh, crumbling infrastructure back home. And if you expand that, and you know Ben and Jerry's had a bus and they went all over the country on the Pentagon budget. If you expand that, you have the opportunity cost in place. You say, got more jobs are created by infrastructure per billion dollars than by unnecessary weapon systems and empire ad adventures. That's the way you get the attention of members of Congress. That's the way you get the attention of the Chamber of Commerce, you, labor unions, local municipal officials. People have some significant influence over their state legislatures and Congress. And people, when they all get together like that, produce press because they're unlikely allies. And finally, scandal. There's got to be more reporting scandal. Uh, people think that the military part of our economy is the most organized and well run. Not everybody, obviously. But that's the impression. Uniforms are never out of place, you know. There's a reason why the military is so well dressed and groomed. The, the whole veneer is order, about face, attention, yes sir, you know, it's order. And yet when you're in the military, you see what a lot of bullshit it is. It's just a crapshoot. It's disgusting. There's huge sexual harassment in the military. There's huge waste and corruption. When I was in the, in, the, uh, in, in the military, they would throw away whole loins of pork that were left over. They wouldn't even give them to the pigs to eat. Just throw stuff away. They're throwing huge trucks and all kinds of things from Afghanistan as they limit things. Scandal wakes people up, especially if it's the level of the $1,500 toilet seat cover. Last point is this. What we have to recognize is that the military industrial complex compromises the three branches of government and neutralizes them and forces them to behave in unconstitutional and illegal matters. And so we have 1.2 million lawyers in this country. And they're more than just attorneys for clients. They're legally obligated by the code of ethics to be lawyers for the advancement of justice and the rule of law. And we all have an ob obligation to arouse them. You don't have to arouse that many to arouse them. In 2005, 2006, the head of the ABA, American Bar Association, he got together left-right lawyers, people who were lawyers for the CIA and FBI retired. And they put out three white papers, Bruce was one of them, and they sent them to George W. Bush and it says, here are three white papers where you are behaving unconstitutionally. He never, they never even got an acknowledgement. 
the largest bar association in the world and very conservative. But it was a great step forward. And more of these steps can be carried forward at all with the support of law schools and law school deans. Because, you know, at the bottom of all of this is whether we're going to have a society under the rule of law that generates the democratic processes and due process, or we're going to have a society where the law of greed and, and, and brute political power is going to prevail. So this is a great challenge to conservatives and liberals. I'm very pleased to have been invited here by the American Conservative, which is going to make a lot of waves in the next few years, way beyond its circulation, because it's, it's going to attract a wide array of leadership, of readership, and get the common ground that we have to pull together on. I'll be out there if you want to get this book. We have 24 areas where left-right converges, which we're not told about by the ruling groups. They want to divide and rule us. And where you can hear the wisdom of Admiral Rickover, who I might say is almost forgotten by today's young generation. Admiral Rickover, who's he? It's very important to hear. His final summation, after 60 years in the Navy, there's no officer in the Navy has come close to spending that much time. And he built the nuclear Navy. And he said in his testimony, I wished I had the power to sink them all. This is what happens when we get into that conundrum that Eisenhower pointed out. We can destroy them. They can destroy us. Is this the way we want to live? Thank you very much.